Section two of Astounding Stories twelve December nineteen thirty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Slaves of the Dust by Sophie Wenzel Ellis. Part two. Come, Oakham, continued Sir Basil. Here is a rare opportunity for you to see how completely I have mastered the laws that govern organic matter. Help me prepare. For several minutes Hale worked under the scientist's sharply spoken directions. By the time the injured man was brought to the laboratory, Sir Basil was ready for him. Unani Asu was still conscious, but his pale face indicated that he had lost much blood. When the improvised stretcher was lowered to the floor, Sir Basil sent all the Indians away. Unani Asu opened his eyes and called feebly, Anya. Be still, ordered Sir Basil. Anya is not here. Please, gasped the dying man. I want her, my Anya. Sir Basil sucked in his breath sharply. What's this? Have you been making love to Anya again after my warning to you? The sufferer stirred uneasily. No, he panted. But perhaps my hour of release has come, and I want to look at her once more. The scientist smiled unpleasantly as he eyed the magnificent body which looked like a broken statue in bronze. Some human characteristics are strange, he muttered. In spite of everything I do, this fellow continues to love Anya, Anya whom I intend for myself. He stepped to the apparatus and swiftly changed one of the adjustments. Perhaps, he resumed with a gleam in his eyes that chilled Hale, this will forever cure him. In another moment the still half-dead body was lifted and gently slipped into a compartment. Before Hale's horrified gaze fastened on the eyepiece, which revealed moving pictures of every process that went on within, Unani Asu's body was reduced almost instantly to a fine, silvery dust. "'Good God!' he cried. "'You have killed him!' The scientist's teeth showed in his wide smile. "'Think so? Does a woman destroy a dress when she rips it up to make it over? Do you mean me to understand that you can reduce a living body to its basic elements, and then rebuild these elements into a remade man? Watch, warned the scientist. Hale looked again and saw the silver dust that was once a living body being whirled into a tiny grub-like thing. He saw the grub expand into an embryo, and the embryo develop into a fetus. From now on the development was slower, and he often stopped to talk with Sir Basil. Once he asked, If this man had died naturally, could you have brought him back to life? Sir Basil shook his head. No. When once the mind electron is completely freed from its enslavement by matter, it is forever beyond recall by the body it has just vacated. Like atomic electrons, whose equilibrium has been disturbed, break away from their planetary system and go dashing off into space, only to be drawn into another planetary system, the mind electron may be enslaved almost immediately by extraneous matter. Had Unani Asu died, his liberated mind electron might at once have been captured by a jungle flower going to seed. Immediately a new seed would be started, and now the former Unani Asu would be a seed of a jungle flower, later to find new life as a plant. Suddenly the scientist threw up his hand and cried, You see? The mind will be eternally enslaved as long as there is life. Oh, for the time of deliverance! He gazed fanatically into space as though he dreamed magnificently. Hale observed him thoughtfully. When that great brain weakened, the consequences would be frightful. Sir Basil, as though he had made a sudden decision, went over to that part of his machine which he called the Molecule Disintegrator. Oakum, he called out, I have taken you partly into my confidence. Now I want to show you something. Come here. Hale obeyed with misgivings. The scientist pointed out the window to a group of Indians, anxious relatives of Unani Asu. Watch, he ordered. Turning one of the projectors on the machine toward the window, he sighted carefully and pressed a button. Immediately one of the Indians fell to the ground and struggled. His companions began dancing around him in evident joy. Faintly to the laboratory came a familiar chant, which Hale recognized as Anya's death song. Dust to dust, mind to mind. He will shed his body as the green snake sheds his skin. As Hale watched, the struggling Indian's body seemed to shrink, and then instantly it disappeared. 
"'Watch them scatter the dust,' said the scientist. One of the Indians stooped and blew upon the grass. "'What have you done?' Hale gasped. "'You've killed this one. Oh, I see now. These poor devils are totally ignorant that you are killing them for practice. They worship you while you turn them to silver dust.' He turned angrily on the scientist, as though he longed to strike him. "'Keep cool, young man.' Sir Basil held up his fleshless hand. "'There is no death. Change, yes, but no permanent blotting out of consciousness. Can't you see the horror of it as nature works? When your time for release comes, as it inevitably will, your mind electron might find new enslavement in a worm.' Hale's reply came hotly. "'If that is true, why do you murder these poor devils deliberately? My dear Oakham, perhaps you are not so brilliant as I had hoped. All that I have done thus far is only child's play, in preparation for my real work. Haven't you guessed by now what I am getting ready to do? No, I'm a poor guesser. The scientist made a gesture of mock despair. Then let me tell you, the molecule disintegrator is active only on organic structures. When I concentrate it so, he reached out again, sighted the projector on some point beyond the window, and pressed a button. One single living organism passes out. See that jupati tree by the rock disappear? Before Hale's eyes, the tall slender tree melted into air. But, continued Sir Basil, if I should broadcast my molecule disintegrator on electron magnetic waves, destruction would pass out in all directions, following the curve of the Earth's surface penetrating earth, air, water. He wet his lips carefully. You understand? Hale stiffened suddenly. I understand. No life could survive these vibrations of destruction? Through every corner of the earth where life lurks, they would reach? Yes, cried Sir Basil. There would be not a blade of grass, not a living spore, not a hidden egg. Think of it, Oakham. No more would the clean air and the sweet earth reek with life, and at last the ultimate mind electron would be released forever. He was breathing fast, and his emaciated face burned with two red spots. Hale thought rapidly. He was convinced now that the fate of all life lay within that diabolical network of chemical apparatus. At last he said, "'And what of you and I, Sir Basil? Shall we too be caught in this wholesale destruction?' "'Not immediately,' replied the scientist. "'Of course I want to remain in the flesh long enough to be sure that my purpose has been accomplished. I have provided a way for my own safety. If you desire, you may remain with me.' He smiled craftily. "'I have planned to keep Anya also, the woman whom I called into life, and made as I wished.' His words pounded against Hale's tortured ears with almost physical force. With a supreme effort the young man controlled his rage and despair. Anya needed him too much now for him to risk defeat by showing his emotions. To Sir Basil he said, "'But if all life disappears from the earth, what shall we do for food, you, Anya, and I?' Sir Basil lifted his brows. "'You don't think I overlooked that, do you? What is food? Various combinations of the basic elements. I, who have conquered the atom, need never worry about starving to death.' All this time the machinery had been humming, and now the humming changed its note to a shrill whistle. Sir Basil went to the eyepiece and looked into it. Opening a door in the machinery, he disappeared inside. He came out soon, flushed and evidently elated. "'Bring the stretcher, Oakham,' he ordered. Hale brought the stretcher, placing it close to the machine. Then Sir Basil opened a metal door and gently eased out a human body. It was Unani Asu unconscious, but alive and breathing. Hale, helping the scientist to get the man on the stretcher, noticed that the crushed legs were perfectly healed. Together they bore him to a long seat. The Indian's eyes were still closed, but his even breathing indicated that he was only sleeping. Suddenly Hale pointed a finger and cried out, "'My God, Sir Basil! Look at his hands and feet!' Unaniasu, still lying like a recumbent bronze statue sculptured by a master, was perfect from shoulder to wrist, from thigh to ankle. But somewhere in that diabolical machine through which he had passed, his hands and feet had undergone a hideous metamorphism, which had transformed them from the well-formed extremities of a splendid young Indian into the hairy paws of a giant rat. 
Hale turned away his head, sick with disgust. Sir Basil cut the silence triumphantly. Now he'll never again face Anya with love in his eyes. What? broke in Hale. Did you plan this monstrous thing? Of course. I told you I should forever cure him of his mad infatuation. But why didn't you kill him as you killed the others? It would have been the most merciful way. Sir Basil showed his teeth in his ugly smile. A creator is never merciful. A quiver passed through the Indian's body, and presently he sighed deeply and opened his eyes. He seemed dazed, puzzled. He looked from Hale to the scientist, and turned seeking eyes to the other parts of the laboratory. "'Anya,' he called weakly. "'Where is Anya?' He pulled himself a little unsteadily to his feet, to the spatulated, hairy rodent feet that had come out of the life machine. Staggering, he would have fallen had he not thrown out his arm to steady himself. Instinctively, he tried to grasp something for support. And then, for the first time, he discovered his deformity. Hale was never to forget that expression of horror and disgust that swept over the Indian's face as he spread open his revolting extremities and stared at them. A sudden, wild roar of despair rang through the room. "'Amu! My hands!' The scientist smiled with evident amusement. "'You are a grotesque sight, Unani Asu. Do you want to see Anya now?' The fright and horror faded from the Indian's face, for now he glared with hate into the mad, mocking eyes. "'You did it!' the Indian ground out. "'You've made me into a thing from which Anya will run screaming.' Through the quiet rage of the perfectly spoken English ran a thread of sorrow. Amu, whom we considered too holy to name. Choking, he hobbled away to the door, which he unbolted. As he passed out into the open, Sir Basil went over to the machine and began sighting the projector, which cast forth the ray of destruction. No, cried Hale, you've done enough murder for today. The scientist paused. I was trying to be merciful. And then, I wonder if it is safe to let him go, hating me. Oh, well. He shrugged his narrow shoulders. I seldom leave the laboratory, and certainly nothing can harm me here. He touched the death projector significantly. Hale made a mental decision. I must find out how the damned thing works, and put it out of commission. With this determination uppermost in his mind, he assumed a more intense interest in the strange laboratory. For the next two days he assisted Sir Basil so assiduously that he learned much about the operation of the life machine, and gradually he stopped being horrified as the fascination of producing life in the laboratory grew upon him. After he had assisted the scientist in building living organisms from basic elements, he ceased to cringe when he remembered that perhaps it was true that Anya was created in the mysterious life machine. Once the scientist declared, she is untainted with inheritance. She is the perfect mate that I called into life so that before I pass from the flesh, I may taste that one human emotion I've never experienced, love. That very night Hale kept a secret tryst with Anya after the village slept. Sweet, virginal Anya, who knew less of the world than a civilized child of twelve, what a sensation she would create in New York with her beauty, her culture, her natural fascination! With her in his arms, and an orange tropical moon hanging low in the hot black sky, he ceased to care that she had no ancestors, for now his one passionate desire was to save her from Sir Basil and to hold her forever for himself. He might have been content to go on like this for months, tampering with creation in the daytime, courting Anya in secret at night had not Unani Asu come back for revenge. On the fourth night after Unani Asu had disappeared into the jungle, Hale went to the Igarape to meet Anya. He had gone only half the distance when he encountered her, running frantically up the path toward him. "'Hale!' she gasped, falling into his opened arms, where she lay panting and exhausted. Hale gently patted the long braids, shimmering in silver tangles under the moonlight, and crushing the soft little trembling body close, he murmured, "'What's the matter, darling?' She dug her face deeper into the bend of his arm. "'Oh, Hale, I saw Unani Asu a few minutes ago.' For several moments she was unable to go on, for sudden sobs cut off her breath. "'It's terrible, Hale, what Amu did to his hands and feet. 
But what Unani's going to do to Emu is still more terrible. Hale placed his hand gently under her chin and tilted up her small, pale, tear-drenched face. Be calm, Anya, and tell me plainly. Still clinging to him, she went on. He told me that Emu is a devil, Hale. He showed me his hands and asked me if I could ever get used to them and be his squaw. The round gold breastplates and the necklace of painted seeds clinked together over her panting bosom. I told him about you, Hale, and then he seemed to go mad. He said he'd kill Emu tonight. But, Anya, why did he let you go, knowing that you would give the alarm? He didn't let me go. Her petaled lips parted in a faint smile. I escaped. Unani Asu tied me to a tree by the Igarape. Because he doesn't hate me, he could not bear to tie me too tightly. Then he must be close to the laboratory now. If he breaks in upon Emu, oh my God! Hale remembered the death projector. If Sir Basil were in danger of attack, he would not hesitate to touch the waiting button that would broadcast death throughout the world. He seized Anya's little hand and cried out, Run, Anya! The only safe place now is Emu's laboratory. Run! As they dashed on madly, Hale opened wide his nostrils to scent the heavy, flower-laden air of the jungle. Any moment all this sweet, rich life might vanish instantly. He had a horrible vision of a world devoid of life, a world of bare rocks, dry sand, odorless dead waters. For it was life that greened the landscape, roughened the stones with moss and lichen, thickened the ocean with ooze, and turned the dry sand into loam, life that swarmed underfoot, overhead, all around. And now, just as they reached the laboratory door, panting and frantic, a hoarse shriek broke forth. Dragging Anya after him, Hale dashed forward, conscious of two masculine voices raised in passion. The door to the room where the life machine performed its vile work was locked. Hale pounded against it and called out to Sir Basil, but only curses and the sound of tumbling bodies came from beyond the door. Although originally the door had been thick and strong, the destructive forces of the tropics had pitted and rotted the wood. A few blows of Hale's shoulder broke it down. Under the brilliant electric light, Sir Basil and Unani Asu were fighting upon the blood-spattered floor. The struggle was uneven. The scientist's emaciated body was no match for the splendid strength of the young Indian. "'Help Emu!' cried Anya, pushing Hale forward. Emu was being choked to death. Hale acted fantastically but efficiently. Catching up a bottle of ammonia, he moistened a handkerchief and clapped it against Unani Asu's nose. Instantly the Indian choked, released Sir Basil, and fell back gasping for breath. Hale thrust the handkerchief into his pocket. Get out, he ordered Unani Asu. Quick! He threatened him with the ammonia bottle, but Unani Asu was not looking at the bottle. Emu! he screamed, pointing. When Hale saw and understood, he leaped across the room to plant his body in front of Anya, for Sir Basil was behind the life machine, reaching for the controls of the ray projector. Suddenly, from behind Hale, a silver streak shot across the room. Sir Basil groaned and sank to the floor of the laboratory. A keen-bladed dissecting knife thrown by Anya stuck out from his left breast. Anya ran forward, sobbing wildly. Oh, Emu, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for it to strike you there. Only your hand, Emu. I didn't want Hale to die, Emu. I didn't. Oh. She was on her knees by the scientist's side, his head held in her slender arms. He's breathing, she rejoiced. Some asata, Hale, quick. Hale found a bottle of good brandy which he had contributed from his own supplies. Soon Sir Basil gasped and opened his eyes. He stared about him wildly, then gasped. I'm dying, Hale, Oakham. Quick! The life machine before my mind electron escapes. He tried to pull his body up, but fell back, weak and panting. Hale hesitated, looking doubtfully at Anya. For God's sake, quick! screamed Sir Basil. I'm dying, I say. I must have rebirth. Lift me to the disintegrator. Hurry!" His voice trailed off faintly. "'He is dying,' snapped Hale. "'We might as well try it.' He jerked open the door to the disintegrator. "'Here, Unani Asu, lend a hand.' Instantly the Indian came forward, a peculiar pleased expression on his handsome face. In a moment Sir Basil's body was inside, and the machine began its weird humming. 
the humming that indicated the transformation of a human body into dust. Now, cried Unani Asu exultingly, going behind the machine, I have helped him enough to understand that if one changes this, and this, and this, he made some rapid adjustments on the machine, something that is not pleasant will happen. Stop, cried Hale. What did you change? The Indian laughed mockingly. Wouldn't you like to know? But yet you should not worry. You have no cause to love him, have you? I can't be a traitor, Unani Asu. Arrange the machine as it was originally, and I give you my word of honor that when Sir Basil comes out I'll wreck the damned thing beyond repair. See, Unani Asu, you and I together will smash it. The Indian folded his arms so that the repulsive things that should have been hands were hidden. It's too late now, he admitted, shaking his head. Yet I've done no more to him than he did to me. Hale went to the eyepiece in the machine and started to look inside. Unani Asu stepped forward, tapped him on the shoulder, and fingering significantly the dissecting knife which he had picked up, said, I am operating the machine. Will you sit over there by Anya and wait? It won't be long. And, white stranger, remember this. I am your friend. I am turned against none but our common enemy. He pointed significantly to the machine. Two hours passed, long silent hours for the watchers in the laboratory. Anya fell asleep in a sweet childish bundle upon the piled cushions, her golden hair still decorated with the red flowers which she always wore, crushed and withered now. Several times Hale caught Unani Asu gazing at her sadly, and his own look saddened when it rested on the Indian's strong, outraged body. The humming of the machine changed to a whistle. Placing his fingers on his lips in a signal of quiet, Unani Asu whispered, "'Let Anya sleep. She mustn't see this.' Opening a door in the machine, his handsome face lighted with a grim smile, he whispered exultingly, "'Watch!' A scuttling sound issued forth, and then, half-drunkenly, an enormous rat tumbled out, one of those horrible rats with the hairless, human-like faces that had so frequently come from the life-machine. Hale could not crush back the cry that issued from his throat. "'Where is Sir Basil?' he gasped. "'There!' cried the Indian, pointing to the kicking rat, which was fast gaining strength. Hale staggered back. "'No! You don't mean it, do you?' Unani Asu turned the rat over with a contemptuous toe. Yes, I mean it. Behold Emu, the man who thought himself creator and destroyer, the man who said that a human being was no higher than a rat. Perhaps he was right, for see this thing that was once a man. Hale buried his face in his hands. Kill it, Unani Asu, kill it. Unani Asu's low laugh was metallic. You kill it. Hale uncovered his face. Open the disintegrator. Gingerly he reached for the rat's tail. But his hand never touched the animal. The hairless face turned for a second, and the little beady eyes blinked up at Hale with an expression that his fevered imagination thought almost human. Then, like a dark shadow, the rat dashed away. Once around the room it scampered, hunting for an exit. Hale started in pursuit. He was almost upon the animal again, when, leaping up from his grasp, it landed on a low shelf where chemicals were stored. Several bottles fell, filling the room with fumes. Another bottle fell, and suddenly, amid a thunderous roar, the ceiling and walls began falling. Some highly explosive chemical had been stored in one of the bottles. Hale was thrown violently against the couch. His hand touched Anya's body. One last shred of consciousness enabled him to pick her up and drag her out. In the open he fell, aware, before blackness descended, that flames leaped high over the laboratory building and that Unani Asu lay dead within. Hale and Anya, leaning over the deck rail of a small steam launch, gazed into the dark waters of the Amazon. "'We ought to reach Para by morning,' said Hale, "'and then, dearest, we're off for New York.' Anya, wearing one of the first civilized dresses she had ever donned, and looking as smart as any debutante, slipped her little hand into her husband's. "'Isn't it a shame, Hale,' she moaned, "'that the fire burned all the animals and insects, "'the machinery, and even your notes.' "'Her beautiful face saddened. "'Just one or two specimens might have been proof enough "'for your, what you call it, club.' "'The knee science club, darling. "'No, I can't expect to win the Woolman prize, "'but I've won a prize worth far more.' "'He squeezed her little hand, 
and looked devotedly into her blue eyes. And Anya, I've reasoned out something concerning mind electrons which even Sir Basil overlooked. What is it, Hale? He maintained that matter seeks always to enslave mind electrons. But I am convinced that mind electrons seek to enslave matter. Understand? It's creation, Anya. Had Sir Basil succeeded in broadcasting death throughout the world, the freed mind electrons, as in the beginning, would have started again to vitalize inorganic atoms. And in a few million years, which is no time to the mind, the world would be humming with a new civilization. Large thought, eh, sweetheart? End of Part 2 And End of Slaves of the Dust by Sophie Wenzel Ellis